Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Well, I want to start with, um, with the question, have the elites failed? First of all, what is success for us? What does it mean success for me as a Palestinian? I'm a, I'm, I'm a Palestinian young man who experienced two uh, intifadas or two rebellions, let me say, or two uprisings. The first intifada, I was young and I was, you know, that was the start of my life. It started back in, 2000, in 1987, and I can say that for me the success is freedom, dignity, freedom of travel, having a Palestinian state, and ending occupation. Now, going to these parameters, did the elitists succeed or failed? I can say clearly that they failed. The first thing that I want to start with is that the intifada and the lessons they learned was a learning experience and inspiring experience for the Arab world. The elitists back then, or the leaders back then in the first intifada started when they saw this kind of, of grassroots movement or people movement, they tried to hijack because they felt threatened and they thought that the people might impose the political agenda. They, so they went through it and they tried to hijack. Um, the second failure was not investing what happened and the successes that happened in the, sec in the first intifada. And we started by going into the peace process after Oslo Accord and the Oslo Agreements. We went through the, uh, the peace process and we, were, we hoped as Palestinians that we build a flourishing economy, a democratic state, the institutions at least for the state and so on. But we ended up of having corruptions, no democracy, and so on, as you know. The third failure I can say is that um, by the beginning of the second intifada, and there was a strategic fault, and the strategic, um, I can say between two brackets, crime that was committed against the Palestinian people, which is turning what started as a grassroots and, and civic popular intifada or uprising, turning it into a violent one, and by doing this, that was a strategic fault, and we kind of also, the leaders back then, tried to hijack the agenda. We taught the Arab world and the Arab people what does it mean, and this power of the grassroots, and it seems that during the past 20 years, we forgot what we taught the Arab world, and what happened in Tunisia and in Egypt, it also inspired us as Palestinians and reminded us with something that we were pioneers and we used to be pioneers in. In many Arab countries, it was kind of imitating what happened in Egypt or in Tunisia, but in Palestine, this is something unique and this is something traditional that we know very well and we experienced very well as grassroots and, and people. So it started, even though it started very humble and very moderate, the March 15th demonstrations and movement wasn't against occupation, by the way, or wasn't only against occupation. It was directly and clearly demanding Palestinian reconciliation and asking the two big parties in Palestine sit down, talk, and agree because we have a bigger challenge we want to face as Palestinians, which is occupation. And we will never be able to deal with the bigger conflict if we are divided and we couldn't deal with the smaller conflict or the internal conflict. So another failure for the leaders is that they also tried to hijack this agenda by getting from in, or sending their supporters or getting themselves within and trying to shift or uh, direct it towards somewhere else. I was in Al Manara Square on March 15th and we were demonstrating one of the Palestinian, very significant Palestinian leaders. He was there interviewed by one of the reporters, I guess. One young man was passing through and he asked him, if you are here and demanding reconciliation and demanding to end the conflict, then who is the problem? These people, they, they showed up in the, in, the, uh, in the squares and they tried to show that we also demand reconciliation while in fact they were the problem and they tried to hijack the agenda that was um, 
you know, that was on, on, the, on the political agenda back then. We cannot underestimate what is happening on the street because I believe that the Palestinian or the Palestinian street or the Arab street affected what is happening in the Palestinian street and vice versa. So the, the grassroots movement and the people's movement also as in can impose the political agenda, can affect strongly what the politicians and the elites do or think. So uh, this is something that I believe in that the lessons that we taught to the whole world or to the Arab world at least reminded us that we have to wake up and, and act as, as a grassroots. On the other hand, it reminded us and taught us that we can also affect our leaders and we can impose the agenda rather than have, letting them hijack the political agenda. I think that for Israel, success would be, you know, um, going beyond the initial phase of struggling for life and moving on to normality and investing in life and, you know, having a prosperous, what was uh, once beautifully uh, called the new Middle East and now is cynically viewed as a utopian, you know, really having an open society and expanding on the basis of what we've got. We obviously didn't reach the uh, um, new Middle East that uh, Shimon Peres and all those beautiful faces of the early 90s envisioned. And we ended up with a status quo. And the status quo is a failure, not only because we're just muddling through uh, this status quo, but because we deserve more than that. And uh, I think that the greatest failure from my end, is that the status quo has actually become the vision <laughs> that the leaders uh, sell us. Uh, holding on to this kind of reality of a conflict, the conflict management has become what we in Israel aspire to. And I must now move on to the second point of who is to blame. We are not in Israel a society uh, like Tunisia or Egypt. There's no dictatorship in Israel. This fact means that we, are all, we all have a shared responsibility for the failure uh, so far of adopting the status quo as the ultimate vision for, um, for the Israeli society. And civil society is equally to blame in Israel for internalizing the kind of mediocrity, uh, mediocre vision that the leaders uh, offer us and adopting it as well. Finally, how do we overcome it? Um, beyond getting better leadership and more bold leadership, I think that myself as a, civ as a citizen, I can speak about uh, two main um, challenges that I face. Reminding the people around me that we deserve more than that, that uh, we deserve more than an ongoing struggle for conflict management and that we are entitled to a conflict resolution. The second challenge that we face as citizens is to call out the real devils in our society. Uh, it is so easy for Israelis to point the finger at the Muslims, at the Palestinians, at the Arabs, whatever you're going to call them. It's much more difficult to come out and point the blame at Jewish terrorists that are a minority but are a strong you know, a strong minority that hijacks the agenda. And I believe that if any society would be able to call out the devil within that society and kind of separate from this old paradigm of Israelis versus Palestinians and move on to a new paradigm of extremists, uh, of moderates versus extremists, then we have a chance of moving forward. There's obviously a big difference to conceptualizing and speaking about something which directly affects you and your community and struggle from within, if you like, uh, gives you a very different perspective. So I say this, uh, all my comments will be from the outside. I've also spent most of this year, I would say, almost drowning in the Arab Spring since uh, Tunisia in January. Uh, I and my colleagues have been running around explaining, commenting, observing and trying to keep up with it all and I do think we all need time for reflection and particularly in the course of the debates we've had, uh, particularly at Chatham House and elsewhere, 
the question of what's happening amongst the Palestinians has raised its head, uh, particularly where there's been questions of whether there will be more protests such as those seen uh, in March and indeed whether they will turn to violence. But I think this sense of urgency that what's happening elsewhere in the Middle East is casting this central conflict in a very different light and as we will see from uh, the actions uh, both at the international level and more locally amongst Israeli and Palestinian leaders as well as civil society, I think we're seeing, unfortunately, a growing context and period of incoherence. We have the incoherence of an international community, the European Union, US primarily, who are still insisting that a negotiated settlement uh, is the way forward. Uh, but of course, for those who followed the speeches at the end of May, uh, no one the day after, certainly the day after uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's speech to the US Congress actually believes that anyone uh, wants to go back to the negotiating table. We've had on the Palestinian side the Fatah Hamas agreement, which may or may not uh, have been provoked in part by the demonstrations we've heard about in, in March, but the appeal for national unity coming from civil society clearly alarmed uh, leaderships both in Gaza and in the West Bank who both know that their legitimacy is dependent on some kind of results being produced because neither now are actually legitimately elected uh, on behalf of the people they purport to represent. So they have to deliver uh, results. On the Israeli side, I fail to understand what the long-term strategy is. Uh, we hear, again, the official talk is that a two-state solution has never been more urgent, and yet you see very little uh, in evidence to back this up, which rather suggests that the cul-de-sac of some kind of one-state mess uh, is envisaged. So it's against this incoherent background. I thought I'd talk a bit more about what's going on uh, amongst the Palestinians. And the first thing to say is it's not just the Palestinians in the occupied territories. I think what's interesting, taking the lead from the role of social media uh, elsewhere in the Arab world, is a sense of trying to construct a national unity based on the entirety of the Palestinian nation. Two thirds of Palestinians, you'll be aware, live outside the occupied territories in Israel. And through various internet and blogging uh, activities, uh, a very lively dialogue has risen up between different actors, both inside and outside the region. The diaspora is also present in Europe, North America, and elsewhere, as to what is required to reconstruct a united Palestinian nation. As we've already heard from Samir, we're primarily focused not so much on ending occupation first and foremost, but on the requirements for national unity. And everyone is now focused on damage limitation, if you like, for September. What is the plan, even if indeed 130 states uh, recognize a Palestinian state in the General Assembly in September, what is the plan for day two, given that the US Congress last week voted that if in this eventuality that all aid to the Palestinian Authority would cease? While I would salute uh, the change in mentality, which I think for the purposes of a discussion on civil society that you see amongst certainly the younger generation of Palestinians who are no longer uh, depicting themselves as victims, but in the same way catching the current, if you like, of dignity, of purposefulness, they are expressing the idea that they have been failed so long by their leadership, they've had enough and they actually want to be like other people. They don't want to engage in violence. And I think it's looking into how this non-violent resistance part of what's being claimed can actually be nurtured and not indeed manipulated, as these things often are, into more violent trends uh, that we should now pay much more attention. And I fear that one of the incoherencies I've mentioned, certainly from the international community, uh, from Israel, and indeed, sadly, the Palestinian leadership, is as yet I see no sign uh, of those, uh, those individuals, those actors, engaging uh, with this broader trend. And particularly internally, obviously, it's very difficult to see how a Palestinian nation, based on the worldwide recognition of the rights of Palestinians, can actually uh, be concretized in anything other than a virtual recognition of, of national identity. It's not clear to me at all how this can be translated into either uh, a two-state or indeed, as some are talking about, a one-state solution. What we surely are facing is 
not too many elites disconnected from the people, but too few elites and elites of any real competence because a social movement is what? It's a mass presence. Right now it's Twitter and Facebook. Most revolutionary movements have happened quite adequately spurred by that sense of loss of dignity, that sense of anger, that fuel. But they then have to be concretized around a narrative, uh, around policy demands, and yes, around leaders. And that's one of the problems, I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, about the current Arab Spring, is it, it doesn't have yet a clear set of policy demands. It doesn't have a, 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 a clear leaders. It is lacking an elite, and that's one of the big problems. There are certainly some elites there. If you go down Avenue Bourguiba in Tunis, you'll see a shiny new office block uh, in which the Ennahda party, uh, that's the uh, Muslim Brotherhood sister party in, in Tunisia, it is active, it's sending out organizers, it's doing some pretty rough things at night which aren't being reported. Uh, that's to say, busting into women's meetings, breaking them up, uh, stopping uh, uh, feminist uh, meetings taking place, attacking Christian churches. And I think back 30 years ago to two other revolutionary changes, uh, 1980, 81, Polish solidarity. And what did it define itself as? A self-limiting revolution. It insisted on peace. It was a sine qua non, uh, because if they, anybody had picked up a single stone and thrown it at the tanks or at the Polish communist cops, then it would have crumbled in ruins. Yes, it was repressed, I have to say, in December 1981, but there was such a impact of moral authority. That search for non-violent resistance is so essential, and it does require more than movements. During the 30 long years of struggle in Northern Ireland, uh, the IRA did some terrible things, you know, atrocious bombings of killing many innocent people. And there were great movements of peace. There were mothers and women who came out to the streets of Belfast and elsewhere, won Nobel Peace Prizes, marched, were heroes. But as long as the IRA, as long as Jerry and Martin wanted to keep killing and bombing, there was no movement. It wasn't until they declared a ceasefire, and that ceasefire stuck for one, two, three years, it opened real space for dialogue and talks and finally the peace movement. It's not a perfect peace, I mean, Northern Ireland, go to Belfast, Derry, other places, it's apartheid segregation, but at least there isn't direct uh, killing. And that kind of uh, cold peace, perhaps, non-violent peace, and two communities living slightly edgily side by side is what perhaps we should want for most of all uh, in Israel. What we actually need in Israel and in the Palestinian movement, and in politics generally, is better elites. And we might have a first-past-the-post system in Israel instead of their insane uh, proportional representation electoral system. That could be a start. And I would, you know, urgently, and I really admire what Tao was saying about Jewish terrorists, just three or four years of no violence, and I think the atmosphere could very dramatically change. But if people keep in their back pocket uh, the right to bomb, to kill, to, to throw the odd petrol bomb, you know, in the occupied territories, then uh, I don't think we're going to be able to move forward irrespective of what happens in uh, other parts of um, the countries affected by the great movement so far this year. So it's a very slippery concept, this concept of popular will, because uh, who can measure it? Um, it can change very quickly, as we've seen in the Arab Spring. Uh, often people's feelings are contradictory. If you ask them one question, they give you one answer. You ask them a seemingly contradictory question, they give a contradictory answer. So is it useful to think about popular will? And if it is, where does the popular will now lie in Palestine uh, and uh, Israel? Tal, let me start with you on that. I think that uh, people's aspiration, as I've said, have, have decreased. The popular will have de is decreased to uh, just wanting to get by <laughs> and uh, not necessarily um, have the same kind of visionary uh, scope that our founders of the state had, but just to get by from day to day, muddle through. This is kind of the popular will to ho cling on to a, a, an unsustainable status quo 
and make sure that no one is hurt and if, it, if he or she are hurt that it's not someone from your own people. In general I can say and from my experience and from my observations and involvement in, in One Voice and other grassroots <coughs> movement, I can say now the biggest attention will be is paid to internal issues like we want freedom, we want dignity, we want democracy, transparency and so on. But that doesn't mean that also the political agenda is there even though it's less important nowadays. Concentrating on the internal issues and advocating for improving the internal situation will at some point hit a block or a wall if the political situation stay as is and there is no progress on the political front because if we have, uh, according to the International uh, Bank uh, report, you know, the Palestinian economy was doing well even though it depended a lot on the international aid, that's, that's true, but it also, um, you know, achieved a lot on, on this, uh, on the economical level and that was also an internal and popular will, I can say, because people want to have a better life, better jobs, uh, and so on. But again, if this does not, if we progress on this internal issues and we don't have any progress uh, on the political issue, I'm afraid that everything will fail and we will enter into a chaos uh, one more time. I mean, what dri drives peace very often is not hope for peace, it's resignation or its abandonment of any idea of military success that the, the, the conflict won't succeed so we better have peace because nothing else going to work and okay in a way that's kind of what happened with the IRA so do you think this kind of resignation and this focus on more prosaic issues could actually be a good thing in terms of people getting you know uh, we need less idealism in a way Yes, I think this is a generation who are much more down to earth. What they're asking for is normality, that it's the language of exceptionalism associated with Israel and Palestine that I think in many ways they're trying to break out of. They want to do the same things everybody else does and they're aware that over the last decade or so, uh, because of the actions of Hamas and others, they've been depicted uh, largely as potential terrorists, as a risk to Israel, uh, that people that the Israelis cannot trust. And I think it's partly, as I said, it's partly an internal struggle uh, to establish what that popular will is because they have not been well represented in recent years. I, I was going to originally answer your question by saying the popular will is best measured by free and fair elections. And the last time the Palestinians had that in 2006, uh, things fell apart, uh, things disintegrated. You might say that was a snapshot of their anger with Fatah and which translated into support for Hamas, but I don't think anyone was supporting the consequences of the Hamas victory leading to the arrest of the Legislative Assembly, the dismantlement effectively of institutions linking Gaza and the West Bank. So in effect, that particular election led, made things worse rather than better. So I think this is a new way of expressing a popular will to say, look, we're not a risk to anybody. We're really, really not interested in pushing Israelis into the sea or any of this sort of nihilistic armed struggle, uh, zero-sum game. We want to live in peace, and they have actually established links with Israelis uh, including through one voice, uh, but in other ways to say, look, we're, we're, we're all in this together and we're all wasting our lives on this conflict. And our leaders, just as Dennis has said, are extremely absent from resolving it for us. Right, across the world we're seeing a, a centrifugal politics, we're seeing a de uh with the rise of identity single-issue politics. Right across the world, the Tea Party is a bossy... Uh, Northern League, uh, and the, the centrist traditional post-war parties right across the world, or post-war politics, just find it harder and harder and harder to make sense. I mean, it's an enormous conceptual crisis, and it can go very, very negatively and very, very badly wrong. So in that sense, the Israelis and Palestinians haven't got good models to choose from. I mean, it's a kind of cliche, isn't it? But I'm, I'm interested in your sense as to whether or not it's a cliche which could apply to Israel and Palestine. That, that in a sense, it's only when the extremists are in control that peace becomes possible. You know, that for years, you would hope that the, 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 the official Unionist Party would beat, would beat the Democratic Unionist Party because they were more moderate and that um, uh, the SDLP would beat Sinn Féin because they were more moderate, because not realising that it was the only the DUP and Sinn Féin who would have the legitimacy to be able to achieve peace. To what extent is it, therefore, that one's hope lies in 
the, the apparent triumph, the, the, the apparent strengthening of a more, more extreme positions both Israel, in Israel and Palestine? I think uh, the worlds in which uh, the Israeli political class is living and the world in which the Palestinian political class is living are diametrically not meeting in the middle. They're in parallel. I won't say they're diametrically opposed because they're both saying they want a two-state solution. But I think the critical gap now is between the Palestinian leadership, uh, which, as I've said, is losing legitimacy and has all, all but lost it, uh, trying to make up for lost time to keep their populations on board. And I question in Israel, I know there's, there's growing alarm, and Tal has expressed some of it, uh, in terms of the mediocre results that the Israeli government has produced for them. So there has been a lot of uh, restrictions imposed on civil society, uh, expressing certain types of political view in Israel, which is, should be worrying in a democracy. Um, the whole language of delegitimization and demonization is actually applied as much uh, to Israeli universities within Israel as it is to potential opponents, uh, you know, the academic boycott lobby, etc., in the UK, which I, I think is very worrying because actually labelling your opponent rather than actually engaging with them um, is, is a way of actually avoiding the problem, not resolving it. And I think far too much time has been spent on these issues rather than saying, look, we can't control people's attitudes, but we can actually do something about improving both people's lives and the context within which... Uh, these things operate and denying that there is a problem by saying it's their fault, it's their language, they're opposed to us, uh, so therefore it's end of discussion will not resolve the core issue. And it's the fact that no one seems to be controlling the core issue, uh, particularly on the Israeli side, I find most worrying. Could Benjamin Netanyahu be the next Ian Paisley, someone who goes from looking as though he's completely incapable of constructive dialogue and then suddenly becomes a leader for peace? Everything mm. is possible. He certainly has, you know, from if you analyze, he certainly has the ability to do it uh, from the international point of view. He has an Arab peace initiative in his, uh, that, that can back him up to do it. He has a supportive American president. He has a very stable coalition that everyone is happy with a very uh, you know, comfortable ministerial chair that means nothing. So he, he can do it. The question is, does he want to do it? I don't know, but uh, I think that it ultimately the the question. I mean, they always criticize Netanyahu for being very uh, um, uh, prone to pressures. Will we pressure Netanyahu to deliver? And uh, at the end of the day, it's very it's very fine to convene in an assembly room and and discuss the fine details of any future agreement and policies. I I, I wanted to to comment earlier to, to say that. <coughs> It is not the. Uh, um, it, it is abnormal in my mind that the people focus on justifying the faults and, and the failures of, of their leaders when it comes to foreign policy. I was thinking just earlier on uh, that uh, um, you know we all have, uh, for instance, a Ministry of Transportation. We don't justify the failures of the Minister of Transportation by focusing on how uh, irresponsible and reckless drunken drivers are or how crooked the roads are. We just demand him to do his job or her if uh, it's um, the minister and get on and provide a solution. And if Israelis you know, and Palestinians leave the, uh, uh, this uh, unproductive uh, uh, discourse of a blame game and try to find why the Palestinians are to blame as Israelis and why the Israelis are to blame as Palestinians, but just demand that the leaders get on, sit in the room and don't leave it until they come up with results or they leave their office. When we change the disc and, and the tune and demand that, as we do from minist other ministers, I think we'll have progress. As long as we are focused on the blame of the other side, we provide a very comfortable uh, um, atmosphere for non-action from our own leaders.